Hello and welcome to Bangalore International Centre's very own podcast, BIC Talks. Bangalore International Centre is a platform for informed conversations, exchange of ideas and a space for arts and culture. BIC Talks brings the essence of all that the physical space stands for and more to your doorstep. Hi, I'm Pavan Srinath and welcome to BIC Talks. This year is the 250th anniversary of the birth of Beethoven, one of the greatest composers the world has ever known. The anniversary has been marked with celebrations across the world. Here at the Bangalore International Centre, as a part of our Poetry Festival, we created a four-part series of short films on Beethoven's life and work. The series was curated by Pratiti Punja Balal and adapted here for our podcast format. Over to you, Pratiti. Thank you, Pavan. Welcome to the Bangalore International Centre's BIC Talks. On today's programme, we present the first segment of our four-part series, Beethoven Variations, a poet's journey through the music and life of Beethoven with renowned British poet Ruth Padel and eminent pianist Karl Achmeyer. Ruth will take us on an intimate journey through Beethoven's life and music, illustrated by her poetry from her recent book. Professor of poetry at King's College London, she has written 11 collections of poetry and many books of non-fiction and fiction. Her earlier book, Darwin, A Life and Poems, released on Charles Darwin's centenary, captured her great-great-grandfather memorably. Concert pianist and lecturer Karl Lutchmeyer held an academic lectureship at the Trinity College of Music in London, now Trinity Laban, for 15 years. He has played at all the major London concert halls and across the world, and his London lecture recital series, Conversational Concerts, garnered critical and public acclaim. Carl will perform Beethoven's music for us and give us his insights into its composition and context. In future episodes, they will be joined by guest artists, soprano Nina Cantor, cellist David Waterman and Vendelian String Quartet, one of the world's leading quartets, and the South Asian Symphony Orchestra with musicians from the countries of South Asia and the diaspora. Today, in part one of the series, Ruth and Carl will take us through Beethoven's early years, his childhood in Bonn, his arrival in Vienna, first as a virtuoso pianist and then as a promising composer, and his early worries at age 28 about deafness. Over to Ruth. My name's Ruth Bedell, and I'm a poet. I've written a book of poems about Beethoven, and it came from my family upbringing. I grew up playing music in the family, playing Beethoven's instrument, the viola, in fact. And also from five years' work with the Endelian String Quartet, when they played Beethoven in concerts and I read poems between. And also, of course, out of what we all share, love and veneration for Beethoven's music. Beethoven was born in 1770 in Bonn, a little outpost of the Holy Roman Empire, which was ruled from Vienna by the Habsburgs. Vienna was the musical center of the world then, but Bonn was a music center too, and the court there had a private orchestra, and Beethoven's father was a not brilliant singer in that court. Musicians are tradespeople, Beethoven was born in an attic in a little street of tradespeople. His, the landlord was a lace maker in the bottom two floors. And the household was not a happy one. Beethoven's father was alcoholic and abusive. What does marriage hold, said his wife to a neighbor, but a little joy and then a lot of misery. He had two younger brothers. And his father spotted very early that his eldest son had an extraordinary gift for music. He taught him himself at first, the, the clavier and the violin. He used to come back drunk at night, haul him out of bed and stand him up to play the piano and beat him if he made a mistake. So he was a hard taskmaster. And 
I wondered when I wrote the first poem about him, what it was like owing your piano gifts to your father, who was also such a bully. If your father damaged you, the way meteorites spin in clustering on Antarctic ice, because your father is magnetite, dragging all the iron in your soul into his own force field. You seal yourself in. You need nothing but music. Your answer to obstruction will be fire. In the little hall of the house where you were born, light falls in shallow hollows, in flagstones where I imagine your mother carrying the shopping, your father staggering home drunk up these stairs to wake you in the middle of the night, stand you for hours on a bench so you can reach the keys. You cry as you play, slapped if you make a mistake. In daylight, he hears you improvise, splashing around, he calls it, on the violin. What rubbish are you scratching now? Isn't that beautiful? No, you made it up. You're not to do that. Stop or I'll box your ears. If your father damaged you, but he was the one who made you beat the notes into you on the clavier, viola, violin. Your response to challenge ever after will be attack. You will need no one, only the relationship of sound and key. You improvise. So his father wanted him to be the next Mozart, the next child prodigy, and he would make a lot of money from him. It didn't work out like that, but he did send him one winter on a tour of the Rhine, a concert tour down the Rhine. He couldn't go with him, so he sent his mother with him. And this was really the only documented moment of intimacy the mother and boy ever had. Beethoven was about 11. His mother warms his feet on a boat. He goes to school dirty. They say his mother must be dead. They call him Spaniard because he is dark. They tease him about his name. He leaves school to play the viola in the briary tangle of an orchestra. He wears a sea green coat, a wig, a little sword. At home, he writes concertos, pitching the wonders of modulation against his father's blows. Gliding north with her down the Rhine on a winter concert tour, their one journey together. She keeps him warm, holding his feet in her lap. The other person who in his early life was a great promoter was the organ master at court who taught him the keyboard, Christian Gottlob Nefer. And it was Nefer who paid for his first publication which was variations. He became very good and very well known in Bonn for improvising and for variations, which are the development of one theme into lots of different moments. Here is the pianist Karl Lutschmeier with Beethoven's first printed publication, his first early music written when he was 12. Thank you so much, Ruth. And for my part, May I say what a pleasure it is to be part of this festival, in my case, coming to you from my home here in Oxford. When we see the young Beethoven through the lens of these variations, we very much see the man. A creative imagination, profound and yet fecund. So many ideas teeming up, welling inside this music. Certainly all the things we might expect from the composer who's going to become one of the greats of his time. This set of variations might well have been largely based on the tropes of its time, tropes known certainly to Haydn and Mozart, but very much to the lesser composers. And we do certainly see figurations that abound, but in each case, Beethoven does something extra with them, a little twist, a turn, an unusual figuration, for myself, learning this piece, especially for the performance for you, I had to try out new combinations to get my hand around some of these things that I really haven't come across in other music. 
And certainly when we see the notebooks of Beethoven, he's always trying out new things, little figurations, ideas, concepts that might get used sooner or indeed much later in his compositional career. The piece itself stems from the fact that his teacher, Nifa, challenged him to write a set of variations on this little-known composer, Dressler, and this unknown march. And when Beethoven turned in his homework exercise, Nifa was so impressed that he got it published almost immediately. And we see the title page, Variations on a March by Dressler by Ludwig van Beethoven, aged 10 years old because of course, in order to get better sales, they'd reduced his age by two years, which may or may or not have worked. But certainly Beethoven does not seem to have been embarrassed by what we might call a piece of juvenilia. Much later in 1803, he slightly revises it and then republishes it. So certainly this is worthy of the later Beethoven. And I certainly think that is the case. You know, all the way through Beethoven's life, he writes variation sets, particularly the monumental Eroica variations and the Diabelli variations. But even when we're not talking about variations, he loves to take a theme and during the course of its unfolding in music, always vary it. And so this is an essential process for Beethoven that we find here right at the beginning of his compositional process or journey. And the thing that I find most prescient about these early variations is that they are in C minor. This is one of Beethoven's most important keys, his key of pathos, his key of drama, sometimes his key of tragedy. And sure enough, this set of variations goes through in C minor until the very last variation in C major. And Beethoven so often shows his heroism, his triumph over adversity by taking a large piece such as the Fifth Symphony, taking it from C minor all the way to C major. And so it's beautiful that we do this here, even in the 12 year old boy. We don't have time to hear all of the variations. So I've just selected a few of them for you to hear. And we do finish with this wonderful climax, this last movement in C major. So sit back, listen, enjoy, and marvel at the 12 year old Beethoven.
When Beethoven was 16, his mother died. His father descended into worse and worse alcoholism, and Beethoven had to keep the family on his earnings. But when he was 21, he escaped to where he always wanted to go, to Vienna. He took composition lessons with Haydn, and he began to make a name for himself, first as a great virtuoso pianist, and then gradually in composing. He was doing very well. He went off on international concert tours to Prussia. He wrote his name in girls' books. But then something started to happen, which was the very worst thing that could possibly happen for a young man intent on a musical career. He started to hear a buzzing in his ears and then started to fail to hear top notes. He went on composing, but in the summer of 1801, he wrote a piece, a famous piano sonata, which is so emotional and so revolutionary and seems to embody his wildly angry feelings about going deaf, as well as his great, great sadness. And it was later called the Moonlight Sonata. Moonlight Sonata. We make the life we need. The city's bells are muffled. The sky is frozen copper. You still can hear sometimes, still win the improvising contests. A sonata in C-sharp minor, quasi fantasia. Like a blind girl lit by moonlight she cannot see. New melodies unfold from tiny seeds. Euphoria, then presto agitato, manic rage. The music of loss, of losing. Bass clef, high treble, only once and in despair. Then the new shocked calm of, is it true? Is this what it sounds like, going deaf? He didn't call it the Moonlight Sonata. That name was given to it later by a romantic poet who thought that it reminded him of the moonlight on Lake Lucerne. But it has been famous ever after. And here is the pianist Karl Lutschmeier to tell you a little more about it and to play its first movement. When we come to the so-called Moonlight Sonata, we come and to an extraordinary period in Beethoven's compositional life. By 1800, Beethoven had established himself and his method of writing very strongly in Vienna. We could say that the previous sonata to the Moonlight Sonata, the sonata in B-flat major, opus 22, is the last of the great early Viennese works, a tradition that stems from Haydn via Mozart of sonatas that are balanced. We have four bars, balancing four bars, eight by eight, and with movements that are still reminiscent of 18th century dances. We have minuets and so on. Um, and although the Opus 22 sonata is, is large, it's epic, it's very different from Haydn or Mozart, it is still clearly a logical culmination of those composers and the last great work, I would say, for piano of the 18th century. We then come into the new century, the 19th century, and we see Beethoven in an experimental mood. And these sonatas at this period, three sonatas, Opus 26 in A flat, then the two sonatas, Opus 27-1 and 27-2, The Moonlight, are very, very strange. The Opus 26 sonata has a set of variations in it and a funeral march. And this sonata, The Moonlight, is subtitled Sonata Quasi Una Fantasia, as if though it is a fantasy. And certainly fantasy is what we get. For Beethoven, fantasy at this point suggested a sense of improvisation, a sense of changes and surprising moods. And all of these are very evident in the sonata. When we look at the first movement, it was very bewildering in its day. The critics said, first of all, 
It's in the strange key of C sharp minor. And that was a bit fearful. It clearly wasn't for amateurs to try and play at home. Secondly, Beethoven marks that one should hold the pedal all the way through the first movement. To be fair, we can't do that now on our modern pianos. It would be too overwhelming. But on that instrument, it was a really haunting effect and very surprising, very different from the chic elegance of 18th century piano playing. And this was certainly Beethoven, a new force in the piano and its life. Remember that the piano was beginning to take its place at center stage, no longer in the corner of the drawing room, but in the center. And the pianist was now to be the major protagonist. Although, of course, we know the Moonlight Sonata as Moonlight, actually we think that this opening movement, strange as it is, opening with a slow movement for a sonata, is probably a kind of funeral march in a minor key, very slow, with these repeated rhythms, da, 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 foreboding. And perhaps the most creative and surprising thing is that all the way through, we have these undulating triplets going on. In contradistinction to the funereal characteristic. And so here we have something of great subtlety, which opens the new century, the century that will move from classicism to romanticism, as much through Beethoven's hands as anyone's.
Thank you, Ruth and Carl, for that wonderful introduction to Beethoven's early life and for the sublime music and poetry. Thanks to our audience for listening. Part two of Beethoven Variations, titled Artistic Triumph, Failure in Love, will appear on our next episode of BIC Talks. Do look out for it wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you for listening in till the end. Please share this episode with a friend on social media, WhatsApp or anywhere else. It would mean the world to us. And in case you're listening via iTunes or Apple Podcasts, please leave us a rating and a review. Subscribe to BIC Talks on email or your favorite podcast app and don't miss out on future episodes. This episode of BIC Talks has Gaurav Krishna as our sound engineer with support from S. Sarvanaraj and Lekha Naidu. And the accompanying episode artwork was made by Chandni Venkataraman. Thank you for listening to this episode of BIC Talks. This podcast can be accessed on our website, bangaloreinternationalcenter.org, as well as on any of your favorite podcast platforms. Tune in for new episodes every week. And do subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow our Facebook, Twitter and Instagram pages to stay informed on our latest updates.